Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Harvest Fellowship. Welcome, everyone, online. And it's great to see everyone. Thank you for praying for us uh, as we went down to Florida for the funeral. And uh, just it was, it was impactful. Got to witness. Uh, it was really great, really good. But, uh, so have you ever heard the sound of a common loon out on a northern Minnesota lake? It's beautiful, isn't it? It's beautiful. You know, something more beautiful than that. When I hear babies cry, I love it. Don't you love it? It means there's life in this place. Love it. Yes. We were worshiping, and I heard one kid singing to the Lord in their song. It was great, great, great. Okay, this is the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, I'm not real uh, overly into all of the rituals and those kinds of things, but I think Advent is a great, uh, great thing because basically we remember Jesus' first and his second coming. And so for the next four Sundays, we will remember Jesus' first and second coming. He came first as a baby. That's going to, we're going to see just how wise God was in that whole plan. But guess what? He's coming back. Yeah. That's, uh, that is going to be glorious. Can't wait. Let's pray. Father, your wisdom is way beyond us. If we could just have a teaspoon of it, we would be the philosophers of the world. Help us. Teach us. We confess our ignorance. We confess our need. And we lean on you, our great and awesome God, who promises to give wisdom to whoever asks and to lead us on. So teach us now. About this subject, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 22 through 25. That's page 647 in the Bibles that we give away. So if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. Someone will bring you one. It's our gift to you. And we're going through 1 Corinthians verse by verse. Uh, the theme of the whole book we're looking at is that everybody gets to play. Everybody has a part to play in advancing the kingdom of God. So keep that in mind because we all need God's wisdom in this. And so in this next section, chapter 1, the last half of it, and then all of chapter 2 deals with God's wisdom versus the world's wisdom. This is the second of six sermons on this subject in this passage. So God's wisdom versus the world's wisdom. The world is baffled by God's wisdom. Let me read from David Pryor's commentary He says, it takes much time, consistent study of the scriptures, and constant illumination by the Holy Spirit to reproduce the mind of Christ in a Christian community. That process involves unlearning the wisdom of the world as much as absorbing the wisdom of God. It is important, therefore, for Christians today to appreciate the way in which our thinking has been influenced by the secularism of our own age, in the same way as Paul found it necessary to uncover for the church at Corinth the emptiness and the folly of contemporary thinking. I want to read a phrase in there again. That process involves unlearning the wisdom of the world as much as absorbing the wisdom of God. God's wisdom is different than the world's, and I happen to think that God is smarter. <laughs> now, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the skill of living life in a way that honors God. 
Notice there's an ethical component to that definition. Wisdom is the skill of living life in a way that honors God. Wisdom is when we seek to find out how God has designed the world and getting in on that design rather than rebelling against that design. To rebel against that design, that's the foolishness of our world. And that's what we're seeing. Foolishness fights the design. The world's wisdom rejects God's intelligence, replacing it with its own failed wisdom. In the end, the earth dwellers will find themselves fighting against God. And that is the epitome of foolishness. Let's read our passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 22. For the Jews ask for signs, and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. First of all, we see the opposition. It says, the Jews seek a sign. Now, in and of itself, that's not bad, but it's clearly being stated here in a negative way, isn't it? The Jews seek a sign. The Greeks seek wisdom. And it's saying that that's different than God's wisdom. What is he referring to? Well, Paul very well, very well understood from Matthew uh, what Jesus actually, when he confronted the Pharisees. Go ahead and look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee before he got saved, and so he knew the attitudes of the Pharisees, and here's where they were at. Jesus confronts them, Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. It says, then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered them, an evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So he's telling them because they were seeking a sign because they were actually never satisfied. Some people are never satisfied. This wasn't the first miracle that they had seen. The Pharisees had watched Jesus heal the sick, cast out demons, even raise people like Lazarus from the dead, and it never was enough. Show us another sign. That's what we want to see. And so they're demanding that. Some people are never satisfied. I believe that God gives us enough evidence to convince the willing, but not so much to force the unwilling to capitulate. He gives us enough evidence, enough signs and wonders, and we're going to see the signs and wonders are not always bad, okay, here in just a minute. But he gives us enough. In fact, Jesus appeals to the greatest sign of all. He says the last sign you're going to get is the resurrection. Jesus did rise from the dead. Okay, that is a historical fact. No other religion has anything like that to be able to bring up. And so we see this incredible sign, that should be enough. <laughs> okay, and for the willing, it is, isn't it? It's enough for y'all, isn't it? Okay, I was just down south, so it's coming back, <laughs> y'all. Okay, so... But some people are ne never satisfied. Uh, I remember I, I have a, a friend that I used to teach with. I used to teach eighth grade American history in an inner city school, Walker Middle School, okay? And uh, taught alongside Chris. He was the math teacher, and we'd get together. We'd have him over for dinner a lot because he was a single guy, and he was an agnostic and we'd have lots of conversations about God together. And I asked him one day, I said, Chris, what would it take for, for God to prove to you that he exists? 
And his answer was this. He said, if he would just reproduce a hamburger in front of my face, then I'd believe. That's what he told me. Now, my friend was a little rotund, so I could understand the, 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 the deal there. But I said to him, I said, Chris, if God produced a hamburger in front of you, you'd come up with another way of, dis, of describing how that got there, wouldn't you? And he said, yeah, you're probably right. Okay. Some people are never Satisfied, And that's what he's appealing to here. He sees their heart. The motive of the heart is what matters. Because signs and wonders are not bad. They're actually described as good in the Bible. They're actually described as a part of the gospel presentation, the Great Commission. Look, at, uh, now we'll see though how they can be both bad and good. Look at uh, Matthew 16. Verse 1, okay, Jesus again brings this subject up because the Pharisees bring it up first. Matthew 16, verse 1, it says, The Pharisees and Sadducees approached and tested him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. They did it again. He replied, When evening comes, you say it will be good weather because the sky is red. And in the morning today will be stormy because the sky is red and threatening. You know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you can't read the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left them and went away. Now, here he says the same thing. You're going to get the sign of Jonah, the resurrection. That should be enough. But he also says here, you've already been given signs. In fact, you should have known. You should be able to read the signs. The Old Testament predicted the Messiah over and over and over, and it gave all kinds of incredibly detailed descriptions of what it would be like and exactly when it would happen. A good study of the book of Daniel teaches us that we knew exactly when Jesus, the Messiah's ministry, would begin. We knew it. If you do the math, 483 years after the decree, it says, specifically 483 years later, Jesus shows up and begins healing the sick, healing the blind, just like it says Messiah would be doing. They should have seen that. They should have known they were, they, but they couldn't discern the signs. But others could. Others were excited about it. When you read the story in Matthew of the, of the people looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, they knew, they were reading the signs, they knew it was coming about. Signs and wonders are also good. Look at eight, Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. I like the way the NIV reads this better, but I'm going to read it out of our CSB here. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. It says, so those who were scattered, okay, now it's talking about persecution. Saul, before he got saved, he's persecuting, dragging people off into prison for just for being Christians. And, but then they scattered. So those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. Notice they didn't compromise. They didn't shut up because they were getting persecuted. They, wherever they went, were sharing the gospel. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds were all paying attention to what Philip said as they listened and saw the signs he was performing. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So you notice here, Philip, he comes along, he's there and he begins telling them, but he's also healing the sick, casting out demons, and it says the crowd paid close attention to what he said because of what they saw. The signs and wonders drew many to Christ. So we see that example here. Um, look at Acts 14, verse 3. It says, so they stayed there a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord, once again after being persecuted, who testified to the message of his grace by enabling them to do signs and wonders. This is a part of how they presented the gospel. And this is because Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, go ahead and look there, 
Mark 16, 14 through 20, we see this is Mark's rendition of the uh, Great Commission in Mark chapter 16, verse 14. <clears throat> It says, later he appeared to the 11 themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he had risen. He's rebuking them because the resurrection should have been enough, okay? <laughs> when they heard the testimony of those who had seen him risen from the dead. Then he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes. If they should drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. So the Lord Jesus, after speaking to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the accompanying signs. Here's the great commission, which includes signs and wonders. Now, some people have suggested that that was only for the apostles. And in Acts chapter 14, uh, that passage, verse 3, that was referring to the apostles. But Acts chapter 8 was referring to Philip. He was just a deacon. I call what I call a lowly deacon. Sorry about that, deacon. Okay. I mean, it's just a normal, common person, just like Mark 16 seems to indicate here. Everybody gets to play. You can pray for the sick, and if God is in it, cool stuff can happen, right? I believe that the more we seek after God, I'm talking about being on fire, seeking after God with your whole heart, that kind of seeking. The more we seek after God, the more incredible things we're going to see. It's all up to him. He's sovereign. But the more we seek him, the more we're going to see things take place. Do you believe that? I believe that. I remember a good friend of ours, Sharon Zydek. Okay, she's gone to be with the Lord now. But uh, one, this was when we were pastoring in Orlando. I had a vision and it was a needle. And I saw this needle and I just simply shared it to the congregation. And I didn't know what it meant. Sharon, she said, well, I think it means that God wants to heal today. I was like... Okay, cool. <laughs> Let's pray. Anybody who wants prayer? She says, well, I want prayer. <laughs> she said, I have, she was scheduled to have surgery on her thumb the very next day. On Monday, she couldn't move her thumb. She was going to, you know, they'd already looked at it. Everything was all set. Surgery on Monday. So they prayed for her. And all of a sudden, she says, wait a minute. And she felt something. She says, look, look, I can move my thumb. There's nothing wrong with it. Her thumb was completely, dramatically, com totally healed. Well, that's not the end of the story. She goes back to work on Monday. She was the manager of a Kentucky Fried Chicken place, okay? She goes back to work. Her employees are not expecting her to be there because they have to do extra work because she's supposed to have her surgery on Monday. She goes back and says, what are you doing here? She said, look, look, I got prayer and my thumb got healed. I don't need surgery. You know what then happened? All of her employees came to church the next Sunday, and they all got saved. I mean, yeah, this is what is supposed to happen here. You pray for the sick. They get healed. You share the gospel. At least share your story. This is what Jesus did for me. And then let him do the rest. Could you do that? And anyway, we, we all get to do this kind of stuff, okay? But we have to participate here. That's what we're seeing. And it's common. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. First Thessalonians 1, 5. Because our gospel did, did not come to you in word only, but also in power in the Holy Spirit and with full assurance, you know how we lived among you for your benefit. Now notice here, I love that last part. You know how we lived among you for your benefit. As we, the church, begin to live out the Sermon on the Mount, actually living it out, loving our enemies, etc. That draws people in. 
But prior to that, it says that they shared the gospel. You have to tell people what Jesus did for us, share the gospel, but not just in word, but in power. So what does it mean by in power? Okay, well, let's look. Look at Galatians 3, verse 5. Another passage that's, so Thessalonians was written to the church at Thessalonica. What was their common experience? Well, let's look at the common experience of the churches in Galatia. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. Now, by the way, in Galatians, Paul's rebuking this particular group of churches because they began to actually listen to false teachers who are sharing a false gospel, a gospel of works. And he's rebuking them for this, but look at how he appeals to them to come back. It says in verse 5, So then, does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law, or is it by believing what you heard? So notice here, he's appealing to these two things, their reception of the Spirit and the doing of miracles in their midst, which were common experiences for all of the Galatians. If they weren't common experiences, this would be a meaningless appeal. Am I correct? Okay, so he's saying to them, look, did you get the Spirit? Something they actually knew they had. They didn't just intellectually know from the Bible that says you get the Spirit. They knew they had the Holy Spirit because they experienced the Holy Spirit in their life. And he appeals to miracles that were seemingly taking place in these churches. And he said, did that happen to you because you worked hard or because you simply believed? And they said, well, yeah, it's because we believe. Faith, okay, but... This is what he's appealing to because this isn't something just for the apostles. It's not just something just for the first century church. It's something for all the churches. It's how we're supposed to present the gospel with signs and wonders. The motive of the heart is what matters. Where's your heart? That's why he's rebuking these guys, the Pharisees, for seeking signs. The motive of your heart. Are you open? We were down in Orlando eating at a restaurant. We found a new Cuban restaurant. Oh, man. Can't wait to go back. But anyway, we're sitting down. And as we're eating, I saw this couple sitting down. And I had an impression. I'm supposed to go off for prayer. So I got up. I went over. I said, I know this is going to sound a little silly. But I felt like God told me to come up and offer prayer. Do you have any prayer needs? And the two looked at me, and the the guy, he said, well, yeah, you could pray for our baby. And she was obviously pregnant. And and also our family. There's a lot of strife in our family right now. And so I prayed. Just a simple prayer. We bowed our heads. We prayed right there in the restaurant. And he looked up to me. He's tears in his eyes. This was a guy who looked like he could have been a football player for the Vikings. By the way, did you see that game on Thursday? Okay. Anyway, oh, back to, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, this guy, I mean, big guy crying, thanking me for the prayer. Could you do that? You could do that, Dave, right? Yeah. Donna, you could do that, right? Okay. Yeah. Tyler? Yeah, it's not hard. Just get up, offer prayer. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna be able to make the prayer get answered. That's up to God, but you can offer and then see what he does. I think we're gonna see those in the kingdom. I know they weren't saved. I'm pretty sure they weren't married, okay? But God used that event. Signs and wonders. But the Jews were seeking a sign with the wrong heart. The Greeks, it says, sought wisdom, and, uh, and you can see that in Acts chapter 17, Jesus, or Paul confronts and has a, has a confrontation with the Epicureans and the Stoics. It reminded me when I was putting this together, have you seen the movie Princess Bride? Okay, remember the short guy? I can't remember his name. Okay, the short guy where he's like super intelligent and he's talking to the main guy and he says, have you ever heard of Aristotle, Plato? Morons. Right, remember that part? Okay, okay. Well, in a sense, he was right. Because those guys never came to the Lord. 
Their wisdom didn't lead them to Christ or to God. Some make the intellect their final authority that supersedes, and some even in the church make their intellect the final authority over the word of God. But God is smarter than humans. That's, that's a 101 wisdom, <laughs> okay? God is smarter than, than humans. And philosophy so often has led people away from the Lord when it's, philosophy just simply means the love of wisdom. And yet it's led so many away because some make the intellect their final authority. But philosophy in itself is not bad. Just like signs and wonders are not bad in and of themselves. It's a matter of the heart. Philosophy is not bad. When we look at Paul, let's look at how he witnessed, probably his favorite way of witnessing. Look at Acts chapter 17. This is before he met the philosophers at the Arapagus there. Acts chapter 17. Verse 2, it says, as usual, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a number of the leading women. Notice here he uses these words. He reasoned with them. He was explaining and proving, and he persuaded them. That's using the intellect. That's using wisdom, philosophy, if you don't mind. Look, skip down to verses 17 and 18. Okay, here, just before he has his confrontation with the philosophers, he's in Athens, and in Athens he sees all these idols. He's incensed by the idols, and so it says in verse 17, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshiped God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. Notice here, he reasoned. He used rational arguments. He sought to convince them of these truths. We see this in chapter 18. Uh, by the way, even his confrontation with the philosophers, the Stoics and so forth, we see a pattern of how he shared the gospel. He first would appeal to what they had in common, and you see that at the beginning of his, of his uh, speech with the Stoics and the Epicureans. But then he challenges them and shows them where their views were deficient. And then he finally, in verse uh, 30, he calls them to repent. That's how you present the gospel. Common ground, here's where you're wrong, Repent, because here Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, game changer here. And that's what he always appealed to. And by the way, at the end of this, if you notice here, it says, um, uh, verse 34, some people joined him and believed, including Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with him. So some people got saved there. Chapter 18, verse 19, he says, when they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and debated with the Jews. So he practiced debate. Look at verse 28. It says, this is speaking of Apollos, not Paul, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jews Jesus is the Messiah. Chapter 19, verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, arguing and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Not arguing in the bad sense, but using argumentation and persuasion. He used philosophy. He used reasoning. And this was a common way in which Paul shared the gospel. Now, we all, not everybody has to be a philosopher to share the gospel. Okay. There's actually a lot of different ways, depending on your style of evangelism. You get to be you. You don't have to be Paul. But this is how he did it. There's nothing in and of itself wrong 
with philosophy. That's the point that I'm trying to make here. The motive of the heart is what matters. And the priority of God's word. I love what Anselm said uh, a thousand years ago or so. We don't reason in order to believe. We believe in order to reason. And I think he was wise in that statement. Well, we move on back in our passage. Verse 23, we see that Paul doesn't compromise the message. So he starts out, verse 22, Jews ask for signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. He preached Christ crucified crucified. He didn't try to figure out, oh, I just need to be buddy buddies with the Jews or buddy buddies with the Gentiles, though he did find common ground with them. So nothing wrong with that. But he was confrontational. He didn't compromise in order to try to reach people. Today, sadly, we see most churches compromising the truth, either to avoid confrontation or supposedly to win the world. If philosophy, I think their thinking is if we can, you know, we don't say anything controversial, if we don't say, you know, never call people to repent of their sins, we don't do any of that stuff because if they come, maybe we have a really good band, we do all kinds of other cool stuff, you know, and, and they come and they kind of rub shoulders with us, it'll kind of you know, by osmosis, maybe, people get saved, okay? And that's the philosophy of most churches today. But it doesn't work. Look at Paul. I think he had a really good strategy. It worked, didn't it? <laughs> okay? So, Paul didn't buy into that strategy. He didn't compromise the message. He obviously did it in love, because remember Sermon on the Mount? We can't ever forget that one, okay? Love. Everything we do has to be done in love, but we preach Christ crucified. It was a stumbling block, a scandalon. Uh, because of Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, it said, Curse is anyone who hangs from a tree. And the Jews knew their scriptures, and they knew there's no way Messiah would be crucified, hanging from a tree, being cursed. That can't be the way it's done. But it was the way it's done, because God is really, really smart. <laughs> because that's the only way our sins could be forgiven for Jesus to become a curse for us. Paul knew that. He actually quotes Deuteronomy. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He became a curse. When he died on the cross, he took our sins upon himself. And because that made he became sin, he was cursed by God and hung on the tree. He became a curse for us. He took the punishment we were supposed to pay for our sins. He was received the very wrath of God those six hours that one Friday hanging on the tree. And he did that for us as a substitution because either you pay for your sins or he does. And he says, if you will repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you outwardly profess that faith in baptism. He says, you will receive the benefits of Christ's death on the cross. The substitutionary atonement. That's why we preach Christ crucified. But the cross is offensive. It says that we can't do anything to earn or merit our salvation. We are all so bad. We can't even help in our salvation. It's not even grace and works. It's not me do a little bit, you do a little bit. 
You know, that, 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 that is not the way it works. We're so bad, we totally depend on Jesus Christ. That's why he, when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. It says our sin is that bad that it took this, the crucifixion, for our forgiveness. I remember seeing this sign at a ministry to the poor in Atlanta. So the ministry is called Blood and Fire, where they would minister to the poor and they, they fed the, uh, the, the homeless there. And we would go down there quite often and help out feeding the poor, uh, feeding the homeless. And they had this big painting on the back where everybody, when they got their food, they saw this thing and it said, if I'm okay and you're okay, then explain this. And then Jesus bloodied on the cross. I'm not okay, and you're not okay, but that's okay, because he's okay, okay? Because he died for us, okay? Personally, I have done some horrible things in my life, absolutely horrible, even after, as a Christian. This appeals to me that I can be completely forgiven simply by trusting in Christ and not myself for my salvation. By saying my sin is that bad, but you are that good, oh God. But it's offensive to the self-righteous who want to participate at least a little bit in their salvation. It's also offensive to those who don't want to be told their sin is sin because people have to repent. We have to spring out. Sin is sin. You must repent. And people don't want to hear that. And that's where we are today. But we don't compromise the gospel because there's power in the gospel. Now our passage finishes where we see the called are saved. We're going to see this more later in the next passage, so I just briefly want to touch on it right now, but let's look at chapter 1, verses 24 and 25 of 1 Corinthians. He says, Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The called are saved. We see the divine initiative here. We're so bad, we're not even seeking after God. He's the hound of heaven seeking after us, waking us up. If you remember when you got saved, I'm pretty sure if, it's, if it was like me, I was going the exact opposite way of God, and he arrested me. The called are saved, um, and I can rest in his sovereignty, in his power, in his calling because it says here in the passage, Christ is the power of God. His death really was powerful enough to bring about the complete forgiveness of all your sins, past, present, and future, if you simply surrender and put your trust in him. Christ is the power of God. Therefore, only the weak need apply. And Christ is the wisdom of God. I like what Robert Grimacki says in his commentary. He says, The saved Gentile who once sought rational arguments now marvels at God's sophisticated solution for the problem of evil. Paul's conclusion to this paragraph contains a striking paradox. What unsaved men viewed as foolish is really wise. And what they deprecated as weak is actually strong. The two phrases, foolishness of God and weakness of God, do not refer to God's attributes of omnipotence and omniscience. Rather, they are synonyms for the death of Christ. He's simply showing the comparison. Who is smarter? 
The world's wisdom has led it to where we are at now. Suicide, depression uh, are at the highest level ever in this world. The world is falling apart. Families are broken. Murder and violent crimes are soaring. God is smarter. He is wiser. Now, your actions actually reveal what you really believe about this. We can say all we want that God is smarter, but if we follow the wisdom of the world, we're saying the world is smarter. Are you in the world or are you with God? Do you embrace his wisdom or your own? Let's pray. Father, I I think of that little cartoon where the boy raises up his hand and he says, may I please be excused, my brain is full. All of us are like little children. We are not as wise as we would lead others to believe. And we need your help. We need your wisdom. We once again, and it's a daily matter where we surrender to you, but we once again surrender our intellects, our demands for signs, and we say, I believe, I trust in you. Jesus rose from the dead. I know that you are the all-wise God. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who's never truly surrendered, they're they're on the outside looking in and they've never been born again. They've never repented of their sins and placed their faith in you and you alone. Savior, I pray that you'd draw them today. You'd wake them up and draw them today to where they would say, oh, yes, I believe. The wisdom of God in the crucifixion is amazing. I believe. And he proved it by the resurrection. And help us all. It's so tempting to fall back into the patterns of this world. To start believing the stuff we hear through the media and so forth. So please help us, oh God. To embrace your wisdom. To dig in deeply. And we know that you say, if we ask for wisdom, you will grant it. If we believe. Mm. Praise you, Lord. Praise you. Mm. I do just have a deep sense for those who are struggling with depression. I know that Thanksgiving and Christmas are difficult times, especially with winter and the darkness. So I'm just going to say a little prayer for you, whoever you are. Father, you know each person here. You know where they're struggling. And I ask that you'd give them peace right now. Peace. Yes, Lord. Give them hope. Hope in you. Thank you, Lord. And we believe. I want us to stand up now. And we're going to worship God together. And you just continue to experience that peace as you worship. Let's praise him. I cast my mind to Calvary. Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet My Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down 
in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all Son of heaven rose again. Oh, trample dead. Where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ that day. Oh, oh, praise the name. Just yellow badges. That's they're here for to pray for you. If you need someone to pray for you, please talk to them. In fact, some of them, if you would come up front, they'll be up front here as well. Uh, come up front, and then you can know where they're at, and just come and receive prayer. And uh, may God bless each of you with His wisdom, specifically and especially on how to be used by God yourself to advance the kingdom. It may give you opportunities even this week to perhaps pray for somebody. May he bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. And by the way, I want to say I thank you for just being our church. You, you guys are awesome. God bless you.
cello? Yeah, I was hearing like, 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 like an organ. Especially when we sang away 